Let me first of all say welcome to Encuentro, bienvenidos al Encuentro. Tenemos nuestro ministerio en español con nosotros en esta tarde. We have our Spanish ministry here with us this afternoon and we welcome them and we welcome all of you. We're so glad that you've taken just a little bit of your time this afternoon as we remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. So, so did you ever wonder why Good Friday is called Good Did you ever sit back and think about that? Um, I mean, how is it good? How is it good to worship the death of someone? How is it good to worship the torturous death of someone? As I've thought about that, as I've thought about that and contemplated that the last few weeks, I've sat back and wondered. Wouldn't it be better to call today Black Friday? I know Black Friday is a a different day on the calendar, but wouldn't it be better to call today Black Friday or maybe Grieving Friday as we remember the death of Jesus? How in the world is today good? Good Friday, how can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity, putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, 
overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails. Our sin stopped his heart. And yet, this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. So were you smart enough to catch that video? Did, did, did you catch it? It took me two or three times to watch it. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. The idea being that Good Friday, the cross reversed everything. And so all of that was said one way, and, and then you get to the cross, and it goes back, and it says it exactly the opposite way. Jesus reversing the curse, Jesus reversing our condemnation, the cross of Jesus Christ changing everything. That's powerful, is it not? That's powerful. If you didn't catch it, we'll try to post that video for you so you can go back and catch it again. But I want to take just a few moments before we all partake of the Lord's Supper and flesh out that reality for us for just a few moments so, so that we understand it and so that we comprehend it. And for us to understand what that video just said, we have to travel all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We have to go back to the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve. And you'll remember there in the Garden of Eden that God had told Adam and Eve that they could, treat, that, that they could eat of every tree, of every fruit of the garden except for one. Do you remember? They were able to eat from every tree except for the tree or from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So everything was good until the serpent showed up. Until the enemy showed up and the serpent basically looked at Eve and Adam and said that God was a liar. He said this, he said, you won't die when you eat of that fruit. He said, actually, the opposite is true. If you eat of the fruit, you will become like God. And amazingly, Adam and Eve, who up to that point had believed God, at that moment, they believed the lie of the serpent. They ate from the tree. They ate of the fruits. I want you to catch. I want you to visualize. I want you to understand what happened at that moment because as long as Adam and Eve believed God, they would have life. As long as they believed God, they would have abundant life. They could live a joy-filled, protected life there in the Garden of Eden. A life filled with continuous fellowship with the Father, believing and trusting God with all of their hearts, and God would have protected them. But when they listened to the words of the deceiver, life for them changed forever. Their, their eyes and the eyes of their descendants, us, we're open to evil, open to sin, and open to fear. And God pronounced a curse on them. And God pronounced a curse on all of us who sin just like them. The curse of sin then entered the human experience, and Adam and all of his descendants were condemned to die. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19 says it this way, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, 
and to dust you shall return. I read that verse and I think, wow. Man, that, that, is, a, that is as gloomy and as hopeless as it gets. And quite frankly, if the story ended there, your life and my life would be meaningless. Our lives would have no purpose whatsoever. But the story doesn't end there. God intervened into human history. And God the Father sent the eternal Son, Jesus Christ, to earth. His perfect life and his vicarious death reversed the curse. It reversed and it changed absolutely everything. So that Jesus, when he was here upon the earth, in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, catch this, though he die, yet he shall what? Yet he shall live. So Jesus talking to condemned people, talking to people, talking to us, condemned, deserving to die. Jesus says, if you believe in me, if you don't believe in the serpent, but you will believe in me, you'll live and you'll never die. He says, let me finish the verse, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he asks the question, do you believe this? You see, for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, for those of us who truly believe in Jesus Christ, not just believe that, that he was a, 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 a historical person, but believe that he was and is the eternal son of God who came for the purpose of reversing the curse of sin by us believing and placing our trust in him. Life completely changes for us. And the curse that has been pronounced on all of mankind from the very beginning is reversed. It is completely reversed. So what does that mean for us? Let me just mention two or three things before we partake of the Lord's Supper so that we understand what this means for us. The first thing is this. It means that Jesus took our sin and gave us his righteousness. Let me show you two verses. These are, these are extremely powerful verses. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, notice what Paul says. Paul says, for our sake he made him, he made Jesus to be sin, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see the divine switch that takes place right there? God says, so here are are, are his creation, us human beings who uh, live and experience and who were born in sin. And then here comes the eternal son, Jesus Christ, perfect in all of his glory, tempted just like every single one of us, yet without any sin, any blemish, any spot, any, any failure whatsoever. And God the Father said that he made him the perfect one, to be sin for us, even though he didn't know sin, so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Do you see the reversal that takes place there? Do you see the switch that takes place there? We're condemned, he's innocent. Jesus takes our condemnation upon himself and he makes us innocent. Jonas mentioned it just a few moments ago and we're gonna sing about it in just a few minutes, Jesus paid the debt for us. All of those accusations, all of those condemnations that, that were thrown at us, rightfully so, Jesus paid for. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might live to righteousness. Can I ask you to do something? Let's personalize that. So look at that verse and, and change the hour for my and change the we to I. Would you do that? And let's read that together. Can we do that? Can we personalize that? Jesus bore 
my sins in his body on the tree so that I might live to righteousness. You got it? Let's read it one more time. Jesus bore my sins in his body on the tree so that I might live to righteousness. So there's a second part of that reversal that is equally powerful. So not only did Jesus bear our sin and we get his righteousness, but the condemnation has been completely erased. There's so many verses that talk about this in the New Testament. John chapter 3 and verse 18, for example, Jesus said this, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, notice what Jesus says, Not that they will be condemned, but he says is what? Is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So often we have this misconception that our condemnation is a future event that I have plenty of time while I'm here upon the earth and one day when I stand before God, then I will be condemned. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way it works. Jesus said, if you haven't believed, you are already condemned. You see, to believe the deceiver condemns you, but to believe in Jesus frees you. That's why Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The debt has been completely paid. There's one last thing, and we can mention many others, but one last thing that I'd like to mention before we approach the Lord's table, and it's this. We are no longer servants to sin. You see, you see, there in the, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve all of a sudden became bound. Before they partook of the fruit, they were free. They were experiencing the freedom that they had in God, the freedom that they had in that relationship with God there in the garden. But once they believed, once they disbelieved Jesus and they believed the enemy, all of a sudden they were handcuffed. They were bound. They became servants to sin. All of us have experienced that. Have you ever done something that you know you shouldn't do, but you just can't help doing it? (laughs) That that sin kind of grabs a hold of you and it and it controls you. Why is that? Because the Bible says that if we're not in Christ, we are servants to sin. Sin is our master, sin is our ruler. But when Jesus died on the cross, he not only paid the price for our sins. He not only took our condemnation upon himself, he not only freed us from death, but he freed us from the power of sin in our lives. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. So, so, so play with me one more time. Take the words you there and and change them. For sin will have no dominion over me since I am not under law but under grace. Would you read it with me? Let's read it that way together. Once again, you ready? For sin will have no dominion over me since I am not under law but under grace. Let's read it one more time. For sin will have no dominion over me since I am not under law, but I am under grace. You see, the simple truth is that Good Friday was not just a tragic day that will live in infamy forever. Good Friday is a very special day for us. For those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, Good Friday is good. As a matter of fact, faith not only makes Good Friday good, it makes Good Friday excellent. It makes Good Friday superb. It makes Good Friday tremendous. It makes it outstanding. It makes it wonderful. It makes it splendid. It makes it fabulous. Because on Good Friday, Jesus reversed the curse. And he freed us who were bound by sin. 
You see, because of Good Friday, the course of my life forever changed. And the course of your life forever changed. Jesus changed our direction. And Jesus changed our eternal destiny. So here's what we do today. We celebrate Good Friday. We celebrate it as a congregation with a heart of gratitude. We remember the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So in the first part of the service, we worshiped corporately. Jonas and the team led us as we, as we raised our voices and we raised our hands and we worshiped the only one who is worthy of our worship. We want to conclude our short service today not worshiping corporately, but we want to conclude worshiping individually. We want to conclude worshiping as families. You'll see that there are three crosses that are placed here in the auditorium. Actually, not counting the one behind me, but two crosses down front, and there's a cross in back. At each of those stations, you will see that they have the elements of the Lord's Supper. They have the bread, which represents his broken body. And they have the juice, which represents his shed blood. Just a moment, Jonas is going to come, and we're going to sing that song, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. But Jesus washed it white as snow. So as we sing that, I'd, I'd ask you to examine your hearts. So, so take just a moment of individual worship. Examine your heart. Are you grateful for what Jesus has done? When was the last time you thanked him for reversing the curse? I guess most importantly, Have you done that? Has there been a time in your life where you confessed your sin and you reached out to Jesus and Jesus alone and you believed in him? I'd ask you to take just a few moments and examine your heart and prepare your hearts. And then when you're ready, I'd ask you to come to one of the crosses. You can pick one, either by yourself, with your husband, your wife, with your family. Spend a few moments in prayer there. And then when you're ready, take a bread, a piece of bread, take a cup, and you partake of the Lord's Supper with your family. That's the way we're going to end the service. We're going to end the service with personal family worship today, thanking Jesus that the curse is reversed. What happened clear back in the Garden of Eden, no longer has any power over us, no longer has any dominion over us. Because of Jesus, we've been set free. And that's what makes Good Friday good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the significance of this day. It's not just another day. It's not just another service. It's not just another religious tradition. It's not just another event that we go to. But today we remember with broken hearts, with hearts of gratitude, we remember what Jesus did for us. Lord, even though we didn't deserve it, Father, just as Adam and Eve willingly and purposefully disobeyed your command and believed the lie of the serpent, we confess that we've done that in our lives as well. And we recognize our need for Jesus. We recognize our need for the gospel. We recognize our need for forgiveness. We recognize that somebody, not just anybody, But the perfect eternal son came and took our place, reversing the curse, freeing us from the slavery of sin and giving us freedom in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today. We're so thankful 
for what Jesus did for us. And we worship him and we remember today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.